Hey Gen Zers, this is Mackenzie Amix with today's Gen Z with Mackenzie. And today we're joined by Dmitry Voronsov, who is a New York City-based narratologist. So welcome, Dmitry. Thank you very much for having me here, Mackenzie. So tell us, what does it mean to be a narratologist? Well, uh, it's a relatively rare profession. Uh, it's uh, the easiest way to explain it is that I am a story engineer. I study stories. I uh, uh, figure out what makes them work, and then I share what I learned with oops, and then I share what I learned with my students. That's wonderful. So, how did you become interested in studying the art of storytelling? Um, I am a musician by education. Originally, I studied music um, in Russia, and uh, I worked for a while uh, in the opera theater uh, far away in Siberia, in a city called Novosibirsk, uh, where one of my tasks was to uh, help uh, organize the library. And in that library, we had quite a number of um, fascinating uh, old opera libretti that I worked on uh, translating from a bunch of languages. And uh, I was very young, I was in, uh, in my 20s. And when I was doing that, um, I became fascinated with the way uh, there were similar patterns in the stories used in those opera libretti. And I wanted to figure out what makes all of those stories work. So eventually I uh, started uh, digging deep into the way stories are structured, the ways they function. And um, ultimately I ended up teaching that and studying that a lot more in depth. That's fascinating. So you mentioned that when you were coming across these stories, you noticed that they had similarities and similar patterns. So does that come down to a singular formula that we can use to create a good story? That's an awesome question. Thank you very much for asking that. Uh, actually, uh, there are two schools of thoughts about that. And the, the traditional uh, structuralist thought is that there indeed is a, um, a single pattern, a single paradigm uh, of a story that could be boiled down to and uh, that uh, most of stories match that pattern. I personally uh, disagree with that opinion. I represent the opposite approach. I believe in a syntagmatic approach, an approach uh, of building stories from a, a great number, probably hundreds of thousands of uh, possible building blocks, different options that could be arranged in, um, in uh, virtually countless ways. And so I uh, believe that every unique high quality story um, must have its own uh, absolutely unique structure. There could be some um, pattern recognitions there, but uh, most typically this is uh, seeing patterns where there's none. So uh, no, I believe that every story must have an absolutely unique uh, special structure. That's a really interesting viewpoint because, you know, sometimes um, as not as me, who's not a scholar of storytelling at all, um, it's easy to recognize within certain genres, a similar pattern, whether it's rom-coms or dr dramatic movies or TV shows. So when it comes to having a unique storytelling experience for each different story, how do we create that? And is it possible for each story to be completely unique? Uh, I believe it is possible. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there are two things that uh, I'd like to address uh, based on what you asked me. One of them is uh, clearly present similarity between the stories that we can see uh, or sometimes read. Uh, we can see in the movie theater or on Netflix or things like that. Well, they are indeed uh, often based on similar patterns. Uh, and I think, honestly, that's a little unfortunate because uh, uh, the contemporary view of things um, is that uh, if you know one pattern, you would be able to come up with uh, or create any story you'd like and just uh, match it to the pattern, put a certain element of the story in a position where it's theoretically supposed to belong and the story is ready. So, uh, and uh, that opinion, that point of view uh, results in uh, a great number of stories that are all essentially based on a similar pattern um, Currently, the most popular one in Hollywood, for example, is a pattern known as Save the Cat, created by a very good, really talented, great master of uh, storytelling uh, named Blake Snyder. Uh, there are similar patterns, uh, for example, another one uh, taught by uh, a really amazing narratologist named Chris Fogler. Uh, his pattern is known as um, uh, The Hero's Journey. All of those patterns are very valuable and all of them are useful However, when they become abused, 
when every story begins to be based on that pattern, then we have a problem of uh, cookie cutter stories. So my approach, even when I work with patterns that are used or um, promoted by other storytellers, is to find a unique way to interpret those patterns. But ideally, in a perfect world, I would prefer to find uh, the pattern of the story that's inherent to the story and deduce it from the theme, deduce it from the personalities of the characters. And uh, it's uh, quite easy to create stories that uh, do not match any popular pattern and uh, become uh, so refreshing that really you cannot uh, associate it with something very familiar. Mm -hmm. And I love that you kind of use the word abused to describe these um, these very typical story arcs that are you know seen over and over again in mainstream Hollywood because it kind of limits our perspective on the way we perceive the world and it's like well I've seen this many movies that are structured in the same way so if I meet a person this is how it's going to go this is what's going to happen and it kind of kind of puts boundaries around our our lives even though movies really um, shouldn't be influencing our lives all that much but I love that you bring that up so when it comes to seeing patterns that are unique to each person and finding themes in a unique way. How does one go about doing that? Well, I can give you a simple example. Uh, the majority of contemporary stories uh, are based on the idea that there is a central protagonist, a central character with whom uh, people emphasize, and uh, that that character uh, must undergo a certain change in the course of the story, uh, the protagonist begins uh, the story as uh, one thing, and by the end of the story, uh, as a result of the experience in the story, uh, the protagonist changes. And usually in the Hollywood movies, for example, that change is positive. Um, the person uh, started out as a little bit of, you know, morally imperfect in some, some way, and then by the end of the movie, uh, that person finds uh, some kind of inner growth uh, and becomes better as a human being. So um, what if uh, we write a story in which there is not one protagonist, but three or four or maybe zero? Uh, stories with zero protagonists uh, exist. For example, uh, one story that immediately jumps to mind is a uh, fairly well-known uh, Soviet film uh, called uh, Battleship Potemkin, uh, made in 1925. Uh, and uh, there's really not a single protagonist in that story. There's no character in the center of the story uh, that we should root for. Uh, if we even speak about having a protagonist in that film, uh, the protagonist is the entire social class of uh, working class people. So um, not having the protagonist that's uh, undergoing some kind of major uh, uh, spiritual or uh, character transformation uh, removes a lot of uh, popular story elements that are floating around Hollywood these days. For example, when there's uh, no protagonist who uh, uh, who is reluctant to change in the beginning, there's no such thing as hesitation phase in the story. Uh, and that hesitation phase forms the backbone of contemporary storytelling, of contemporary Hollywood storytelling. So if we remove that hesitation, if uh, there's no protagonist who uh, hesitates before they embark on a journey, if there is no journey, the structure becomes vastly different. It becomes an entirely different type of storytelling. In fact, mm -hmm. it is possible to tell a story without a plot. It is possible to tell a story without, um, uh, without conflict. There are uh, Japanese anime that feature absolutely zero confrontation between characters. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, possibilities there that uh, mainstream storytelling rarely explores. That's really fascinating. Um, and, you know, it seems like it's so out of the box for traditional Hollywood compared to traditional Hollywood to have stories that um, the definition of a story, you know, changes very quickly. So what would it mean to have a story, for example, without a plot or um, you gave us a great example of a story without a protagonist. So what instead does that focus on and what is, in turn is the goal to relate to the audience? Thank you very much for asking this. Uh, that question uh, cuts to the core of uh, why we tell the stories and um, for that matter, why do we create uh, works of art? Uh, in my opinion, uh, people uh, differ from the majority of animals, maybe with some exceptions, is that we uh, create art. We uh, we engage in aesthetic um, creation um, and uh, we um, 
we have an inherent understanding of what's beautiful. So um, the purpose of creating art and the purpose of creating uh, the type of art known as story, uh, the story, the storytelling, uh, in my opinion, is uh, communicating a certain ethical idea, uh, communicating a message to the audience that will help them live better lives, empower them in some uh, meaningful way. Uh, it has to be the idea that uh, makes a person uh, who watches the story, reads the book, um, or perceives a work of art in a museum, for example, uh, that idea should uh, empower the person uh, to, uh, to be happier in the end. Um, and uh, delivering that idea is the core purpose of any art or the, the core purpose of storytelling. As long as we manage to communicate uh, a powerful moral message uh, to a person who is watching our movie or reading our book, uh, it really doesn't matter what ways uh, what methods or, or what uh, tools uh, we use uh, to deliver that idea. The most important thing is uh, drop the idea into the mind of, mind of the person who would benefit from that idea. Absolutely. And um, yeah, so your main focus when it comes to storytelling is um, with film and television stories. So when it comes to the medium of film, where you're, you know, incorporating, you know, the visual storytelling, as well as the screenwriting and the storytelling via dialogue, how do those two mesh together? And how do you use those two um, as, you know, to encompass and create a holistic message for the audience? Um, there are several challenges that I uh, work on with uh, my clients or with my students on a regular basis. And uh, one of them is that um, in practical terms, uh, cinematic storytelling uh, is business. And uh, screenwriters uh, rarely, unless these are emerging screenwriters who uh, have the luxury of uh, uh, writing for themselves, for their portfolio, but uh, working screenwriters rarely uh, have tasks that uh, are not given to them by somebody else. Uh, they usually work on a project that they are being paid to work on. And there are certain expectations from the producer, uh, from the person who hired them to write, uh, that need to be matched. So our job is to first understand these expectations and understand uh, in what way we are limited in our creative self-expression, because we cannot, uh, being a professional, uh, my client cannot just uh, freely express himself or herself. They need to... Uh, pretty much do the job they were hired to do. So, uh, and yet if they do not express themselves, uh, that would become a mediocre story. So uh, there's a uh, strange balance that we need to find between matching the expectations of the producer who hired the screenwriter, uh, matching the expectations of the audience uh, for which we're creating the story. And at the same time, delivering a profound uh, emotional spiritual message uh, that would uh, be useful, meaningful to that very audience, and that uh, uh, would be accepted by the producer who hired uh, the screenwriter to work. So uh, all of that is fairly tricky, and sometimes we also need to um, to adapt the free uh, story uh, that we are trying to create uh, to the mold, to the to the pattern that producer expects. That's very common, uh, and yet we need to find some kind of uh, uh, positive balance, uh, helping them to um, to recognize the unique opportunities that the story presents. Usually it's possible to find a balance like that. And uh, the most important thing uh, when we, uh, or the most important method that we use when we approach the task is to uh, define the theme, the subject matter of the story, the underlying uh, deeper range of themes, if I may say um, that the story has in it, and then presenting through different characters um, as many attitudes to that theme as we can. So our characters do not function just like uh, lifelike human beings. They work as uh, attitudes to the theme that we are talking about. And uh, we make these attitudes seem like they're human beings. We disguise the philosophical attitudes to resemble human beings on a screen. Uh, but the actual purpose of uh, creating all those characters is to uh, let them express a certain attitude 
to the theme we are working on. Each character expresses their own attitude and uh, each character expresses them in, the other, in their own unique way. And in the conflict, in the confrontation or in the collaboration between these different characters, we gradually drive the story toward expressing the idea that we want to express. That's a really interesting perspective. Um, yeah, and it's you know vastly different from more. I'm 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 not sure if this is the correct word, but more shallow versions of storytelling, such as you know what we discussed earlier, where you're centered around one person, you try to develop this person and surround surround that person, the protagonist, with um, very stereotypical supporting characters, versus what you're describing to me is kind of choosing an overarching theme and allowing that theme to shape the characters and the aspects of the characters that are shown. So I think that's really fascinating. So when it comes to your very unique and more free-formed perspective on storytelling, how would you kind of attribute that to your um, background in music as well? Because you're a very accomplished musician. Do you think that kind of influenced you as uh, a narratologist? Um, you're too kind uh, claiming, uh, I can't claim to be truly accomplished musician. I, uh, I practice music regularly. And as a matter of fact, I, uh, besides teaching uh, storytelling, I actually teach music a little bit. But uh, I wouldn't claim to be particularly accomplished. Uh, however, I think that one of the most fundamental qualities that a good writer for film or television should have is the ability to, to, uh, to sense the flow of time. Uh, to feel the time and to feel how, how uh, the audience's perception of time can be controlled. Uh, from that point of view, uh, cinematic storytelling, and uh, by cinematic I mean uh, film and television, uh, is very similar to uh, composing music. Uh, in both cases, as composers and as uh, writers uh, for, for film or television, uh, our job is to, um, in a way, uh, create common experiences with the audience and control uh, their perception of time. So uh, the most important quality in a storyteller who writes for film and television for me is the ability to uh, feel the flow of time and feel these uh, wonderful little things that we can do with time uh, when we tell a story. That's fascinating. So um, as an narratologist, somebody who studies stories and also a crafter of stories, is there a particular story that you would say is one of your favorites? And can you identify the elements of that story that you really treasure? Well, you know, um, I'll tell you my favorite writer at the moment. Uh, his name is, um, well, one second. Uh, as, as soon as uh, I started thinking of his name, it's gone. Um, one moment. Uh, it's okay, take your time. I can yeah, let me just Google him. Uh, I'm sorry, I just want to recommend him because he's absolutely awesome. Um, yes, I got it. Uh, sorry, where's my Zoom? Yes, yeah, so um, this gives me the opportunity to recommend my favorite writer. Uh, his name is uh, Joran Tunström or Goran Tunström, sometimes he's pronounced. Uh, he is Swedish. Uh, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, only one of his many novels had been translated into English. That novel is absolutely amazing, and it's called um, The Christmas Oratorio. So uh, if you guys want to uh, read something really incredible and cool, and uh, something unlike anything you may have read, uh, Joran Tunström's uh, Christmas Oratorio, uh, Oratorio is a novel that I recommend. But... Um, to use a uh, slightly more popular example, um, and uh, that example would probably work well with uh, uh, the method of storytelling that I uh, spoke about a little earlier. Uh, I really like, uh, and I find it useful uh, to share with my customers, uh, Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Uh, because Romeo and Juliet is a perfect example of how a story uh, is entirely created out of the theme and how every character um, represents a certain attitude to the theme. So in my opinion, uh, Romeo and Juliet is a uh, play about uh, the thematic conflict between uh, romantic love on one end and reason on the other. 
And I believe that Shakespeare, um, Shakespeare attitude, Shakespeare's attitude to romantic love was uh, very uh, cold and um, very uh, philosophical. He thought uh, of, uh, he often thought of romantic love as foolishness in a way. Uh, when people, uh, when immature people uh, rush into a relationship um, recklessly uh, without um, weighing pro and con, uh, they may end up uh, dying, you know? <laughs> and uh, and uh, Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet did not see, in my opinion, uh, either Romeo or Juliet or very smart, as very smart or very, uh, or truly capable of loving, as a matter of fact. It was like, uh, you know, uh, teenage infatuation in a way, uh, something that is not worth dying over. And uh, he uh, presented every possible uh, angle uh, in the play of uh, looking at uh, romantic love, uh, at immature romantic love. So he has a character who is, uh, who believes that uh, uh, serving society is the only way to express uh, the, uh, the true purpose of a human being. And uh, that character is uh, the prince, uh, so his job uh, is, uh, you know, to pretty much punish the crime in his state. So when somebody, uh, when Romeo murders Tybalt, uh, Romeo is uh, banished. Um, and that's the only thing that the prince does. On the other hand, uh, there is um, a character of uh, Mercutio who uh, directly expresses Shakespeare's view on romantic love that is just infatuation. It's a dream. And uh, probably the best thing that a person can do uh, is to wake up. And that's what Mercutio does. He pretty quickly wakes up from this life and uh, abandons the world entirely. And then we have Romeo and Juliet who uh, passionately believe in romantic love and uh, they would uh, recklessly do anything uh, to um, pursue the infatuation. And in the end, they die. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a sad story. And Shakespeare mentions that it's a sad story. They could live if they were a little smarter. Yeah, I think those are wonderful examples. Well, thank you for being able to break those down and kind of show us the elements that, you know, um, readers might not be able to see at first glance. It's been wonderful talking to you. And today we've been joined by Dmitry Vorontsov, who is a New York City-based narratologist. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Thank you, Mackenzie.